Okay, so apparently today's topic is about Islamic terrorism and ISIS. And before I'm jumping into the topic, let me just briefly introduce myself. I mean, you already heard about me enough, but I, I got my PhD from the University of Texas at Austin because my mentor here in Korea want me to uh, study there because he want me to study about the international politics of oil there. But somehow I end up with studying political Islam and you know, Islamic terrorist organization. But when I was there, I was a TA for the class of international politics of uh, oil. And there are so many you know, students from the Jewish countries like Saudi, Kuwait, Qatar, and UAE, and et cetera, who are majoring in petroleum engineering there. So you can see the connection between, you know, like the Texas oil there and the GCC oil, you know, related studies program there. So, so I got my uh, PhD in Texas about uh, political Islam again and Islamic finance. And my case study is about Turkish uh, political Islam and Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, which does not exist anymore due to the, the regression of authoritarian military dictatorship by Gener General LCC uh, last year. And, okay, so I'm so glad to hear that you are interested in, you know, Islamic terrorism and ISIS, even though it is not really, you know, happy topic, though. Okay, so I heard I have about 40 minutes to cover, and I have mainly five different topics to talk about today. The first four are about, you know, Islamic terrorism and political Islam and ISIS and, you know, fight against ISIS by the international coalition members and etc. And I'm not sure if I can really cover the last point. It's just about Korea and ISIS and probably the international community. I strongly believe that there is very important relationship between Korea and ISIS or international political Islam. So we will see. Okay, the first topic is about political Islam in general, and I will try to track uh, the historical and political origins of, you know, uh, political Islam, mainly focusing on the colonial legacy by uh, French and Britain before the World War II, and then by the United States government after World War II. The second theme is about Islamic terrorism in general and ISIS in specific. So I kind of classify ISIS as the third generation of political Islamists. And the third uh, theme uh, is that, so what are the key determining factor to explain this prolonged instability in the Middle East. I mean, we know that um, Islam per se is not really, you know, the problem, right? But then the Middle East and Islam is a problem? If so, why? So I will introduce various um, Causal factors to explain the rise of ISIS, the prolonged instability in the region as well. And the fourth one is about assessment of ISIS. I will argue that I do not agree with an argument that ISIS is really popular among the local people and ISIS is really resilient. I don't believe so. Some says that um, people who live in the occupied territory by ISIS sometimes express 
you know, their support toward ISIS. But, you know, in the field of political science, in a very repressive and fierce political environment, people cannot really express their genuine preference, right? Not many people believe that the North Koreans really support Kim Jong-un regime, right? That's the, you know, the typical interpretation of public opinion under a very repressive and coercive and fierce regime. So I will talk about that too. And then finally, again, the watch the role of Korean government in dealing with ISIS as, you know, as a leader of international community with a question mark. So, all right. The origins of political Islam. You know, political Islam is really a neutral term. So when I say political Islamist, we often refer people or movement which tries to promote the role of Islam in political, social, and economic uh, realm in the Muslim world. It, again, it's a very broad and neutral term. So, okay, I, uh, in the category of moderate political Islam, I can see my two dependent variables from my you know, doctoral dissertation. We have AKP in Turkey and also Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And we can also see Tunisian and Nauda party. So those three are political parties who act within the system. And then also we have Islamic fundamentalists. Okay, there is Islamic Revolution Front in Iran, then also Lebanese Hezbollah and Palestinian Hamas. So from this category, we can feel some kind of, you know, the legitimate use of violence in order to achieve their political goal, which is, again, the promotion of Islam in many aspects of society. And then, today's dependent variable, ISIS, and others are belonging to the third category, ex extremist. So we have Taliban, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, Al-Qaeda, and ISIS. So we categorize those you know, groups as radical extremist terrorist organizations. So what makes, uh, what, okay, what's the key difference between moderate fundamentalists and extremists is the, the justification of the use of violence in order to achieve the same goal. Okay, then why we are observing this kind of violent political Islam only in the Middle East, not really in Africa or not in Malaysia or not in Indonesia. I mean, there are some, but not this widespread, you know, prolonged and, you know, like a sudden rise of political, you know, political terrorist groups. Okay, we often say that the colonial legacy is the, is the cause, the main cause. Okay, I am not sure if you ever heard about overdeveloped state and underdeveloped society phenomena. The, that is the, the common consequences of colonial rule. So overdeveloped state means like the state is really, you know, huge and big and everywhere in terms of scope and size regardless of the capacity or ability. Just state is everywhere. I mean, secret police and military and those hard apparatus of the state are just so overwhelming. So that's the overdeveloped state. And at the same time, we are observing underdeveloped society. I mean, this is kind of, you know, sim simultaneous, like a phenomenon due to 
still developed the hardest approaches of state sector, there is not really you know, developed civil society. So overdeveloped state and underdeveloped society can be interpreted as weak state and weak society as well. You know, the state can be big but very weak because it has no capacity to, you know, govern the state. And also the civil society is really weak because those civil society organizations do not have high skill or qualified level of skill to negotiate with the state. But they are just, just too violent or too radical or too militant. So again, when we say overdeveloped state, that means very weak state without state capacity, even though that kind of state has very big physical state power. So I want you to differentiate between state power and capacity. And also I already said that those civil society organizations like, you know, Boko Haram and ISIS and Al-Qaeda and Al-Shabaab are very weak because they don't have like a very nuanced and qualified negotiation skill. So, unfortunately, most of Middle Eastern civil societies are just um, located into the two like extremes. Most of civil societies are too militant, but at the same time, others are too submissive. Can you guess uh, what kind of civil society? I mean, which country civil society? All rich countries civil societies are very, very submissive. Have you ever heard about uh, the very famous political scientific political science uh, proposition like no taxation, no democracy, and no taxation, no representation. If your citizens do not pay tax, then your citizens do not have any right to you know, demand your, your right. And that happens exactly in all rich countries like Saudi, Qatar, Kuwait, UAE, and you know, Oman and Bahrain. So, okay, let's move to the second topic about Islamic terrorism. Okay, my favorite topic, even though it's very gloomy and depressing. Okay, terrorism. Okay, what's the definition of terrorism? It's, again, it's very simple and very neutral. Okay, terrorism is the usual violence by a non-governmental actor in the pursuit of political objectives. So, ordinary criminals may terrify, but they are not terrorists. You know, last, uh, when was it, like one month ago, I attended a pol uh, political, uh, political science conference, and there were two presenters from Russia and China and those people argue that, you know, like Russia and China, like, I mean, their government are against the international coalition fight against ISIS right now. No, oof, no, oof, no. Okay, Russia and China are against the U.S. foreign policy uh, to get rid of Syria's Assad regime. So Iran, Russia, and China are supporting the Assad regime in Syria. And those two presenters argue that, okay, look at the current situation. So the ISIS just like everywhere. And they said that, so the US and the West were wrong because Qaddafi, Mubarak, El Qaddafi, Mubarak, and Ben Ali, and Assad were better than ISIS and Al Shabaab and Al Qaeda and Al Nusra and etc. That was their rationale. 
And do you agree? Hmm. No, I, me, I don't. And I said that, and I, and I asked them, so what makes you believe that mass murderer is better than terrorist? I think both are bad, but in a different way. So I just wanted to pinpoint that ordinary criminals, like mass murder, so like, you know, Hitler is bad, but differently from ISIS. So what makes this kind of, you know, ISIS terrorism different is that, you know, terrorist main goal is to, you know, gain international community's attention. They are so hungry for the atten I mean, attention and public city. So, the demonstrative terrorism is directed at gaining public city in order to recruit more members and or gain more attention. So, we often say that terrorists does, do not want to a lot of people dying, but only want to a lot of people watching them. So that makes those terrorists like distinctive or different from other just criminals. Okay, suicide terrorism. Okay, right now I'm going to talk about you know, suicide terrorists are not really irrational, but rather the leadership groups are more rational. Okay, how so? Okay, I'm, I'm going to talk about the second point. For the terrorist groups, suicide attacks are more rational and more effective and becoming the coercive instrument of choice. Because one of your group members just go to the target and blow him or herself, then your headquarters first doesn't have to go and rescue the member, second, and doesn't have to worry about any information risk. So in terms of those two, you know, strength, the suicide terrorism is much more rational than just other terrorist attack. It's very gruesome, but it is rational in terms of organizational capacity and capability. So, unlike our conventional wisdom, suicide terrorism follows a strategic logic, not really religious fanaticism. Again, due to these two main reasons, and also suicide Suicide terrorism is often designed to attack democracies only. Even though we just saw the Al Shabaab attack in Kenya too, but it's often directed at democracies. Why? Okay, I will talk about that. There, there are two reasons. Okay, if if you okay. If, Okay, let's say you are one of the terrorist members, and do you want to go to terror in, in North Korea? Or do you want to hijack North Korean airplane? Or do you want to, do you want to make North Korean hostage? No, that will not really work, because North Korean government do not care about you know, their citizen much, and also, it's really hard for terrorist groups to sneak and go into the North Korean you know, territory because it's not really open society, but very close authoritarian dictatorial you know, regime. So in terms of these you know, strengths of democracies, terrorists often... Uh, 
often attack democracies only. Okay, so straight, um, terrorism in general and suicide terrorism makes the international relations equation very differently, especially after the Cold War. So during the Cold War, the coercer is the developed strong state, like United States and the West, or sometimes the USSR. But after the Cold War, the equation becomes, you know, the opposite. So the coercer is the weak actor, like, you know, terrorist groups, whose base is like weak countries or third, third world countries, or developing countries, or least developed countries. And the target is the ex-strong state, like democracies and developed countries. Again, the rationale behind this change is that democracies are much more suitable target from the terrorist point of view, because democracies are much more open, and democratic governments have higher obligation and responsibility to protect their citizens. Not those people are, you know, better people, but the system make them do so. Okay, and now I'm moving to the transformation of Islamic terrorism. Okay, we have three different kind we have three different generational transformation right now. And first generation is about, you know, pre-1980s groups. And this generation's main target is the near enemy, meaning that domestic Muslim dictators. So before 1980s, Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood's main target was Mubarak, not really the United States government, or not even, I mean, different sector, like Shiite Iran. And the members are very well educated and from the middle class, and and they're, they're just like, and mostly male in 20s and 30s. And the typical example is the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. But this first generation went through very uh, severe transformation because during the 90s, they went uh, through the Mujahedinization process. During the 90s, the Soviet invaded Afghanistan and the United States support Islamic jihadists, including Osama bin Laden, because during the Cold War, United States need to counterbalance the rise of USSR in the Muslim world. So, after the Cold War, the international community is witnessing the new monster of the second generation, mainly Al-Qaeda. And the main target of Al-Qaeda, or the second generation, is not really their own Muslim dictators, but the evil empire, the United States, far enemy. You know, those second generation got so bitter about the U.S. because they, they, they know that the United States just betrayed them so badly after the Cold War. So those jihadists became very global because their main target is not really domestic one, but rather international one. But not surprisingly, those 
you know, radical and violent Al Qaeda generation does not really, you know, receive huge public support. So we describe those Al Qaeda ish groups as very marginalized so social movement. But as we know that they became monster because, okay, first, during the 1990s, their influence just became very de uh, diminished. Then they need some, you know, new turning point. So they decided to do the 9-11 attack, and then they got enough attention. And then the United States decided to start the war with Iraq. And then, and then their influence just skyrocketed. So some of the analysis argue that if there's no war with Iraq, then we will not really, you know, we would not see the monsternization of Al Qaeda either. But I'm not sure. Okay. Then right now in the year of 2015, we are really observing really monsterized new generational Islamic terrorist jihadist group. Even Al Qaeda wanted to disconnect the relationship with them because they are too brutal. So now we are talking, um, okay, after this, we are going to talk about ISIS. So, the second generational Islamic jihadists are really different from the first generation because the members are really diverse, having various background. So right now, like it's really hard to do profiling about the second generational, you know, terrorist groups. Then the third generation groups. I mean, we cannot really imagine to do the profiling. Okay, so right now, those jihadists are not really male, you know, late 20s or early 30s and, you know, well-educated or, you know, brave enough and sacrifice their, you know, lives and et cetera, et cetera. Not anymore. Uneducated or educated, unemployment, unemployed or employed, and socially isolated or integrated, unmarried and married, and young or middle-aged or male or female. Right now, we are living in an age with you know 48-year-old you know lady, you know suicide bomber, which we never thought about, like you know 50 years ago or 40 years ago. Okay, then now we are talking about the ISIS. So the third generation jihadist and ISIS terror incorporation. So ISIS is really, really different and distinct. It's very, I get really emotional whenever I talk about ISIS because I, I feel that we are fighting with, you know, anti-civilizational, you know, age group. Okay, first, ISIS is very globally, globally literate. I mean, you heard about it, right? They are very business and SNS savvy. I mean, they're, they're the king of Twittering and et cetera, and multilingual and multinational, and one member is from Korea, we know that. And, and no more tribalization and no more parochialism, but they are very metropolitan. I mean, they're, they're very cosmopolitan and metropolitan, etc. I mean, you name it. And secondly, they are very rich and self-funded terrorist group, mainly due to the oil, black market smuggling, kidnapping, and taxation. And third, very, very violent arbitrary mass execution. 
and fourth, quasi-state actor. They are, I mean, they are building a state based on law and order, and also they are providing public service. I mean, but totally depending on their own interpretation and their criteria. So, this is kind of you know, the evidence to support those four different characteristics of ISIS. <laughs> so the, the Twitter page at the far right is about, you know, Twitter war between the U.S. State Department and ISIS headquarters. But the funny thing is that they don't use really, you know, slangs or bad languages. They are very gentle in terms of, you know, arguing and discussing and no cursing, no effort, and no. It's funny. Okay, then. So what went wrong? Why, why do we see this prolonged and severe, you know, violent instability in the Middle East only? What's wrong with it? Okay, many pinpoint the failure of U.S. foreign policy to, I mean, inconsistency of U.S. foreign policy toward the Middle East. Okay, mainly, you know, the Obama administration, which is Democrat uh, administration, decided to leave the Middle East in general and Iraq in specific. So they decide the withdrawal of U.S. troops in 2011 and right after their departure, just the, we just the, the box of Pandora just outbursted and opened. So maybe that's the indicator of you know, the weakness of imposed democracy in Iraq. And also, many say that you know, this is the sad consequences of failed you know, democratization or failure of the Arab Spring. Okay. But I kind of disagree with this argument. Because I don't think the Arab Spring is failure because the Arab Spring is just phenomena of you know civil revolution. And the Arab Spring was characterized by unpredictability and con contingency. So we saw the outbreak of the Arab Spring in the Middle East. So the, the out, outbreak of the revolution is one thing, and the democratization process or the democracy consolidation process is totally another different project. So when I saw the, the outburst of the Arab Spring, I was really shocked. But I shouldn't do that because, you know, the nature of a revolution is very unpredictable. It's very contingent phenomena. And then when I saw the failure of democratization in the Middle East, I was not that surprised because in terms of structural factors, the Middle East has very weak foundation to develop, you know, more solid and consolidated democratization process. Because mainly democracy is depend, the success or failure of democracy is depending on first degree of a professionalized military, which the Middle East rarely has. Second, independence of business elite, you know, from the political elite. The third, very active and developed civil society. Fourth, resource abundance, meaning that 
you shouldn't have you should not have too much oil in your country if you want to develop you know solid democracy so you should have more one two three factors but less fourth factor again no taxation no representation so I want, and I also wanted to pinpoint that the role of SNS in, in the development of the Arab Spring was not that crucial. Meaning that, okay, the SNS was definitely a trigger, but not the structural factor true to you know, bring about democracy. Because numbers tell so. Okay. Look at the Bahrain. In terms of cell phone, cell phone users and internet usage and the Facebook users, Bahrain shows very high numbers, but we didn't really see the Arab Spring in Bahrain. But at the same time, look at me, Libya. We witnessed the huge anti-government democratization uh, demonstration in Libya, but only 5.5% of population used the internet under the Qaddafi rule. And there's a look at Tunisia. So Tunisia is the only the successful Arab Spring uh, case. But Tunisia has, you know, kind of mild, you know, numbers of internet usage. And then, voila, those GCC countries just hit the high numbers of cell phone, internet, Facebook, and etc. The so-called SNS, you know, revolution. SNS revolution indicator. But we didn't... We didn't see any democratic, revolutionary demonstration in the GCC or rich countries, right? So again, SNS served as a trigger, but not the structural factor to bring about the Arab Spring. Okay, Syria. Uh, you know, 46 people use cell phone per 100 people. So look at Saudi and Qatar. Like, one person uses more than, I mean, about two cell phones. You know, think about Abu Dhabi and Dubai, you know. And Yemen. Yemen is the one of the Arab Spring outburst country, but like less than 2% of the entire population used the internet. So, again, wrong, wrong color. Okay. In, <laughs> in order to achieve a solid democratic transition, I wanted to highlight two important components. First, Low security establishment cohesion, you know, you should have like less overdeveloped state, less hard coercive state approaches. And then you should have high opposition cohesion, strong civil society. So we have low, high as optimal, you know, composition, combination. Tunisia, and also we have high, high Egypt, you know, kind of failure because we just saw the regression of military authoritarian dictatorship. And then we have a high, low Syria, just disastrous civil war situation. And also we have a low, low Libya, another, another, you know, weak, weak state. We, we state-driven civil war without any state institutional tradition. Uh, 
Okay, so far I said that yes, a little bit the failure of US foreign policy and a bit of, I mean, the lack of structural factor, like four different structural factors. But I will say not much on the sectarian factor. You know, many political scientists and international relations analysts argue that the current crisis of the Middle East is just because of sector, you know, sectarian, you know, conflict-driven phenomena. But I don't think so. I'm not sure. Because, okay, we and I see lots of division within the Sunni Arab countries too. For instance, like Qatar support Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, but other uh, Jewish countries do not. And also, you know, Qatar support Hamas, but others do not. And in Yemen, okay, many sensational journalists argue that the Yemeni crisis is just because of the you know, proxy war between Shiite Iran and Sunni Saudi. But the former president, Saleh, who was kicked out by the Arab Spring uh, demonstrators, are typical Sunni. But Saleh just like supporting the Houthi militias right now. So what I wanted to say is that yes, there is, of course, sectarian factor, but Sectarian factor is not the critical determining factor. The political actors decide their you know, political behavior and move totally depending on their own interest, not really you know, sectarian factor. Okay, Ooh. I think I have only five more minutes. Okay, so it's time to assess the current ISIS phenomena in Syria and in Iraq. Okay, there are two widespread conventional reasons about ISIS. First, ISIS is very strong and very resilient. Second, ISIS is relatively popular among the Sunni Muslims. Okay, about the first proposition, I don't, dis I don't agree because ISIS is not really resilient but rather very transient, mainly due to two reasons. First, low cohesive of leadership. Do you know who are the two main leader groups of ISIS. First, ex Saddam officials from the Ba'ath Party, meaning that they are really, really secularist. And obviously, second group is the jihadist. So, you know, right now they are making just Transient, content, uh, transient and temporary alliance because they are having one common enemy, the Shiite Iraqi government. But I don't, I don't think that this you know, fragile alliance between the Ba'athist secularists and doctrinate jihadists can you know, last longer. And there's a Importantly, there, there is, you know, there are very strong backlashes from the Sunni tribes, I mean, the local tribes, shocked by ISIS brutality. By the way, do you know who is the main target of ISIS, officially? I mean, they, they just killed whoever says no to them right now, but the main enemy of ISIS it's not the you know, Muslim dictators. It's not the United States. Not the United States. Who is the target, main enemy? The Shiite. 
So Huntington was wrong. Huntington says that there will be strong clashes you know, between the civilizations, but we are right now observing huge clashes within civilization, I mean, within the Islamic civilization. And also, okay, the, the, the third rationale, I mean, third evidence to support my assessment about, you know, weak ISIS is that the ISIS franchisation in the Middle East is not really because of the influence of ISIS, but rather due to the militant groups seeking to co-opt the ISIS brand, they just change their head for their own purposes to gain more, more attention and publicity. You know, like two, two months ago, the news just talked about, oh, ISIS just moving toward the Egypt and Libya and whatever. And I was like, oh, how fast? And I looked at it, but it was not. ISIS was just like a state in Raqqa and in Syria and Iraq, but there, there were different militant Islamic groups in Libya and Tunisia there, but they just wanted to franchise the ISIS brand, and they just changed their head. And also, secondly, ISIS-related attacks in the West, mainly by the lone wolf, are due to the domestic, you know, potential criminals seeking, again, to legitimize their actions. And many of them had no idea about what the political Islam is. I mean, they had no idea about Sharia and Quran and whatsoever. So again, the ISIS is not really, you know, strengthening, but rather more transient in my assessment. And also, second myth about ISIS. ISIS is very popular because Muslims in the region just hate the United States and West so much, and they rather support ISIS. But I don't agree. Because, again, in a very closed and repressive and fierce situation, people do not express their own genuine preference. That's the gist of public lies and private truth phenomena. Again, in North Korea, I don't think many people, probably except the Pyongyang citizen, really support Kim Jong-un. I mean, the leader is just so horrible. Because, like, the Kim Jong-un regime is failing to provide, you know, basic public services. So people do not like him, but they cannot say that. Because they know that if, say, if they say so, then the regime will come get you. So, you know, this is a very kind of famous political scientific proposition. In a fierce and closed dictatorial regime, people never express their own, their genuine, you know, preferences. So, I don't think the Sunni Arabs in ISIS controlled territory really like ISIS. So this is the gist of the falsified preference and distorted public opinion in a dictatorial regime, just like uh, North, Korea, North Korea. So I think that eventually ISIS will be deteriorated into a marginalized group launching sporadic terrorist attacks against democracies. Now we know why. Democracies are more feasible targets due to their own open system and responsibility and obligation to protect their own citizens. Okay, so even though we 
kind of sense that ICC is not really strengthening, but rather, rather like decreasing in their, their influence. But there is still international effort to fight ISIS right now. So by 2014, more than six countries, including Korea, have joined the international coalition against ISIS. And about 20 countries held, had pledged military assistance, whereas about 30 just did for humanitarian assistance. But most of the Sunni Arab allies, like Saudi, Kuwait, Egypt, Jordan, UAE, and Qatar, question the overarching U.S. strategy. While there are growing disharmony between U.S., EU, and Middle Eastern countries at the same time, meaning that this international you know, anti-ISIS coalition does not really work right now. The main reason is that the U.S. is pursuing what? A strategic alliance with Iran, and we are seeing the fruits of it right now, right? The Iranian nuclear deal. So in order to pursue the strategic alliance with Iran, the U.S. postponed the withdrawal of Assad regime policy right now, which really, really make those Sunni Arabs angry. And also, Turkey is not really Arab, but Sunni, Tur uh, Sunni Middle East, Country is selectively supporting only the Iraqi Kurdish forces, not the Syrian Kurdish forces. And also, Europeans have not conducted airstrikes over Syria, whereas the Sunni Arabs have not conducted airstrikes over Iraq. You know why? Because the European countries wanted to follow the international law that the official Syrian government under Assad regime did not really ask the European countries to bomb their own territory. That's why the United States, I mean, the European countries said that we're not going to do the airstrike over Syria. And also, Iraqi government under the Shiite majority politician did not ask the Sunni Arabs to bomb their own territory, even though they are so suffering from the ISIS terrorists in their own countries. Okay, so see, I was kind of right about the timing. Okay, because I, I knew it. I, I knew that I, I, was, I, I could not really cover the fifth theme. It's, okay, fifth theme is not that interesting, <laughs> I think. Um, so maybe, okay, the, the main argument about the fifth theme is that I argue that the Korea government must be more active in dealing with international problems like the fight against ISIS. Not because Koreans just love peace, but because Koreans have a huge problem with the North Korea. And the Korean government argues that we need the international support when we are dealing with the North Korea. Do we? Yes, we do. Then we need provide our support when the international community is dealing with its own problem, I mean, that's world problem. But I was so disappointed or, or so embarrassed uh, to see President Park, who visited the Middle East, and talk about 
the economy, economy, economy. I was like, oh my. Because the region is suffering from the terrorist attack problem, and Korea is the one of the 16 international coalition member. I mean, we all, the Korean government is doing something there already, but she didn't mention about anything related to politics. Maybe she was afraid of the, you know, second, whatever, East Asia, you know, Japanese hostage crisis, et cetera. But I don't think there is really strong causal connections between, you know, passive foreign policy, you know, move and the low possibility of being taken as a hostage. Do you think there is a possibility? I mean, I had a really, you know, severe discussion with the member of MOFA. And he said that, okay, we didn't mention about any political issues intentionally because we are wor so worried about you know, any you know, bad thing happening. And I said, that, no, that's really illogical you know, rationale. There's really no strong causal connections between passive you know, move and you know, safety of Korean you know, nationals abroad. Okay, so that's about my critique toward the current government. Okay, so Professor Kim says that my time is up.